Thank you. So I'll be able to share my screen now. Well, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, so um, to start with, I'll introduce myself uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what uh, Bees and Refugees is all about, uh, what we've been up to and um, what's our next step. Then we're going to go uh, through uh, talking, a we're going to talk a little bit about the honeybee and uh, beekeeping, which is very exciting. Um, so uh, my name is Ali Al Zain. I'm a beekeeper and the founder of Bees and Refugees. Um, Bees and Refugees is an environmental and social organization uh, introducing beekeeping as a craft and therapy to uh, refugees and to local communities, while also um, supporting uh, uh, the efforts in, in in saving the native black bee and uh, preserving its uh, preser preserving it. Um, so far, uh, we well we, we started by crowdfunding crowdfunding for the initiative. So it's a it's a community uh, led and sponsored uh, initiative. Um, so we started last year in um, I believe it was February 2020 when I quit my job uh, in the fashion industry and started this uh, adventure. Um, so we uh, managed to. Um, crowdfund 13,000 pounds and that uh, um, we, we used that money to pay for our first 20 bee, beehive, our first 20 native black honeybee colonies. Um, that, that's when the 20, the 20 native black uh, bee colonies were uh, increased to 30, to 30 by splitting, splitting the hives. Um, since then, we've offered workshops to more than 200 uh, participants, uh, where they were mainly unaccompanied asylum seekers um, and um, students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, please tell me if I'm going too fast, because uh, I, I, tend, I tend to do this. <laughs> no, um, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, these are examples of the organizations that we've partnered with uh, since we started our journey. Um, some are hosts to our beehives and others are our way of connecting with refugee, refugee resettlement programs in the UK. Um, so we offer uh, paid experiences on Airbnb. We have beehives in Jamie's Farms, in Oasis Farm, in Hammersmith Community Garden. Um, we have beehives at uh, Hammersmith Academy, Dulwich Prep School. So we, we also are placing beehives in, in, in academies and school at, right now, so we can use those beehives to educate uh, students on the importance of pollinators. Um, this is not our team. This is, uh, so we're, we're, we're a community-led um, organization so we we always have uh, volunteers uh, join our our work so we have more or less almost always we have 20 to 25 uh, volunteers um, some of them work on our social media others work on uh, painting the hives and building up the hives um, this is where we usually have our volunteers meeting it's in um, in the farm that's in it's called oasis farm in waterloo it's like a, a, a oops sorry that's my cat it's a small uh, hidden hidden gem in in waterloo um so yeah everything we've achieved so far is the result of uh, the collective genius of all these volunteers who shaped the way we work and uh, our pri our priorities um, we do, we do take pride in, in of uh, we, do, we do we do take pride of our uh, volunteer volunteers team and how diverse and strong it is. Uh, we have skill sets from like every life aspect, uh, from creatives to human rights lawyers and media specialists. Um, we even have like two companies right now volunteering. Uh, one is building our website. The other one is building uh, writing the content for the website. This is our. Uh, plan for the future. So we're we're currently um, crowdfunding and uh, we're meeting with investors to um, 
to raise uh, 200,000 pounds in a blend of grant and repayable debt uh, to establish London's first community apiary and food forest um, and to hire uh, key, mem uh, key, team, uh, key team members. So um, as a result of um, having our own base, we will be able to support uh, refugees and local communities in the UK while also uh, using this space to establish similar projects in, in refugee camps, which is uh, the aim of, our pro of, of this project as well. One, one of the goals of this project is to take this, um, this experience uh, to refugee camps where, where refugees are deprived of any sort of activities that could alleviate uh, and support their mental health. Um, so enough talking about bees and refugees. I'm sure you're all very excited to learn about uh, beekeeping and uh, and uh, honeybee. So um, uh, if you have any questions, we can also uh, take a few minutes break if you like, if you have any questions, or we can uh, have like a, a question uh, at, at, like how the questions at the end, whatever uh, the majority prefers. What do you think, Sophie? Um, we can take questions at the end, but if people have questions, you know, in the meantime, they can put their hand up or um, feel free to post in the chat. Yeah. Perfect. So um, in a beehive, like the, the two beehives you, saw in, you say you see in the picture, um, in each one of these beehives, uh, there is one queen, a um, couple of hundreds of drones. Drones are the male bees, and the rest of the colony are all female workers. So in a colony, a small colony usually has 25,000 bees. Um, so most uh, all, the, all the worker bees are female worker bees, so it's a... Uh, a bee colony is is the perfect example of the bliss of matriarchal societies, communities, and like how they work and how they operate. So inside the colony, it's uh, it's all all the workers are female. Uh, the male bees, um, as you can see, they're much larger in size. They have bigger eyes. Um, they don't have a stinger, so male bees don't uh, protect the colony. They don't have a role to protect the colony, so they don't even have a stinger. Um, so male bees just live in the colony. They get fed by worker bees uh, throughout the season, and they just wait for uh, other female, other uh, other virgin queens to to pass by and in. Um, so uh, if they if they mate with with a virgin queen, they they die in the process, and if they don't mate with a queen uh, by the end of summer, you'll see female worker bees carrying dead, uh, carrying male bees and dumping them outside the colony, because they don't want to keep them inside the hive um, when during winter when there is no nectar flow. Uh, they they want to keep uh, they want to make sure uh, there is enough honey so they every season they get rid of all the male bees at, at the end of summer then at um, at next spring so next next year next spring the the queen makes uh, makes more more colonies makes more um, male bees drones this is the biology of a bee the most important thing to 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 know for example is that a bee has uh, a special stomach for honey uh, so this is not the stomach where the bee is processing its food it's a special stomach for honey that the bee uses to store honey uh, when whenever the bee is uh, for example swarming or if they're collecting nectar or if they're uh, using if if they're treating the nectar of the flowers to make to convert it into honey, that's where that's where they take the nectar and they treat it with enzymes in this honey stomach. Then they deposit the uh, the nectar back in in the hexagonal uh, honeycomb. Um, Another important thing, uh, it's quite, uh, it's also very cute that the bee, all bees have uh, pollen baskets. So uh, female worker bees, they have pollen baskets in, on their legs. So um, if you look at uh, a, a close-up picture for a honeybee, 
you'll see that uh, they're very hairy insects. So when they're flying, uh, when they're landing on a flower, the pollen gets attached to their body, then they brush, uh, they brush the pollen down to their baskets, to baskets on their legs. And that's why if you're observing a beehive, you'll see a lot of bees bringing pollen like this, uh, collecting, like coming, basically coming, like flying back to the hive. With, with okay, thank you so much. Two for each. It's still ended at one two for this one. So yeah. it's hi. Really sorry. Could you for everyone who's not yeah. speaking, yeah. put it in front of me. They eat every day, every day. Yeah, and they are fruity, you know. Yeah. Adi, the host, I think you can, you. you can mute. Yeah. You can mute. Yeah, I think you can mute because you're the host. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, don't worry. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure um, who to mute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, sorry, we'll go back to the presentation. Uh, we were, yeah. So we were talking about the pollen baskets uh, on bees legs and yeah so here's here where you can see uh, the, the the bees with the honeybees covered in pollen and then how they just brush it down and they store it in the leg then they go back to the honeycomb and they store it in in the honeycomb um, and the pollen is the main source of protein <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So uh, the stages of bee development. So uh, a worker bee, a female worker bee, takes um, it takes 21 days to develop from uh, uh, from an egg to a fully grown bee. So the the queen bee uh, walks around the honeycomb and lays eggs. That's all the bee the queen bee does is laying eggs all day, all night. Uh, a queen bee lays more or less 2,000 eggs a day. And um, this is the hexagonal cell. So the queen lays an egg. The egg de uh, develops to become um, uh, a hatched larva. Then the larva will grow fully. Once the larva is fully grown, the worker bees would seal the, the cell where the larva is growing. And the larva is sleeping in a pool of uh, food, basically. And then uh, this is how the bee looks like when it's um, 19 years old, 19 days old, and on day 21, uh, the female worker will hatch, will emerge from from uh, from the cell. Um, this is this is the first picture I took for a bee that was hatching uh, in my first colony in London. So you you literally see the bee uh, chew through the cat wax capping and emerge. Um, and then the first uh, task that the bee does is cleaning the cell where it was born, preparing it for the queen to uh, lay eggs again. These are the most uh, common species of bees. And um, so in, in the UK, the most uh, Common uh, bees are the Buckfast and Carni Carniolan and the Italian. Um, so uh, almost 100 years ago, um, the British black bee or the dark European bee, it's the, so the scientific name is the dark European bee and it's, it's known here as the British black bee, uh, was the most dominant bee in the UK since the last ice age. But then, um, beekeepers started importing uh, Italian bees and uh, Buckfast bees and Carniolan. So uh, all these imported bees, when they arrived to the UK, they brought parasites with them. 
and the parasites uh, almost wiped out the 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 native black bee. Um, people thought that they were extinct, um, and uh, some other beekeepers thought that since they were just left, um, they were left uh, only there were there was only few wild colonies left, so they thought that they were aggressive and they were. Uh, not like un they were unable to domesticate the bees, and uh, until now, people and many beekeepers believe that the native black bees are are more dangerous, and uh, and they are wild bees. Um, however, since they're endangered, um, we've decided to keep only native black bees, and we actually realized that they're not uh, they're not aggressive. They're not. Uh, they're just as peaceful as any other bees. If you if you're if you're leaving their honey, if you're not taking all their honey, if you're treating the bees in an ethical way, I think uh, the bee, all the bees could be domesticated, and uh, could they, they're very docile insects. For example, um, in in this video, um, this is um, one of the one of the hives that few of the hives that we have in in a in a in a space called Oru space. Uh, it's a working space in Dulwich, and um, you see that the gentleman who was filming the video was sending me uh, telling me about the bees, and he was he was he wasn't even wearing a bee suit. He was just walking around the bees, and hey, it Ali, just go, uh, it hey. just goes to show how docile these insects are. Hey Ali, uh, day three of the heatwave here at East Dulwich. So just thought I'd give you a little um, update on how our little friends are doing. Um, so this is the hive we were most sort of worried about and we had to pull up these back into. Um, not a great deal of activity happening here, but there's still bees in there. Um, this bee here, I think our second or most active one, is formed a little bit outside the hive. Uh, just weather related. Uh, got similar sort of thing here, but you know, less of a bit, more like they're just chilling outside a little bit, um, hanging out outside. Everything looks fairly well. I'll just quickly open up our uh, most at risk home. Um, not a great deal going on inside, um, as we sort of expected. Um, but yeah. Uh, the rest look like they are absolutely thriving. So, uh, yeah, uh, let me know if there's anything we can do to lessen the burden of the heat. Uh, this is an update on our easiest hive. Looks like they are in prepping a second level. It's exciting. Uh, and uh, you've taken a close up view of this already, but. Maybe you want to see it in action again. There we go. That's the update for tomorrow. Um, now we'll talk uh, about how bees communicate, and I think there is no one better to put it than Sir David Attenborough. So this is an amazing video that uh, he made about how bees communicate, uh, and it's about uh, a dance that's called the waggle dance. I'm sure um, maybe some of you heard of it, but this he, this is an explanation of how bees uh, can pinpoint a location miles away from their hive, and they can just tell each other the location by performing a dance, and it's uh, it's just incredible how, how accurate they are. Um, I'll play the video and uh, Sophie, please tell me if you're able to hear the voice uh, uh, and like the sound properly. Oh. Sorry, I think the... Um... Oh, for some reason, the video is not playing, so I'll... I don't know if it will, if you come out of presentation mode, I don't know, maybe that will work? Um, possibly. Hmm. Yeah, 
was working before. Well, worst case scenario, this is the video right here. Sorry about that. That's okay. are able to send complex messages to one another. You might have to, sorry, Ali, you might have to reshare your screen because we can, we can still only see the presentation. Oh, okay. So, oh, I thought that you were looking at what I was looking for, so. No, we could hear it, but not the, not see it. Share the screen. NEB workers are able to send complex messages to one another. In the wild, they sometimes nest out in the open, but mankind has persuaded them to live and store their honey in hives. The colony's heart is its queen. She is just a little bigger than her subjects and mother of them all. In spring, when food stocks are low, the workers get busy collecting nectar. <coughs> they have a remarkable method of telling one another where to find the most productive flowers. It's called the Waggle Dance. This returning bee has just found a new source of nectar and is going to tell others in the hive about it. First, she gathers an audience. To do that, she climbs on her sister's backs and vibrates her abdomen. Now that she's got their attention, she begins her dance using a code of movements that tell her fellow workers where her discovery lies. The duration of her waggle indicates the distance to the nectar source. The longer the waggle, the further the flower. And the angle at which she dances across the comb tells them the direction to the flower in relation to the sun. Her instructions are remarkably accurate and can pinpoint the location of a nectar source over six kilometers away. Some of her fellow workers set off immediately to find it. In one short season, the colony's workers will visit up to 500 million flowers and will make around 90 kilograms of honey. That is sufficient to sustain the whole colony through the coming winter when there is no nectar to be had. So, so I'm just going to stop sharing and then I'll share my screen again so I'm, I'm, I'm able to share the presentation. So it's a very, it's very incredible. I think uh, we're still, we're still, uh, there are, there is still so much to learn about uh, how bees work uh, and how they communicate and how they work. It's uh, how they work as a collective because you have in colon, in some colonies you have eighty thousand or like one hundred thousand bees working together, just working as one, basically as a collective, and it's uh, just uh, fascinating. Hi Ali, sorry, this is Joseph. Um, I think there's a message from um, Beck for you to, as a host, can you let 
uh, those that are in the waiting area uh, in to join the meeting, please. Okay, Sorry. No worries. Thank you. Do you know how to do that? Yes. Okay. Great. We also have a question in the chat. Um, how many bees are there? I presume that's in each hive. Do you know how many bees are in each hive? Um, but you can estimate the number of bees in each hive by knowing how many frames inside the hive there are and how 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 much how busy the hive is. So it's always estimates. Uh, usually, a, a small hive starts uh, with like fifteen to twenty thousand bees. By the by, like the middle of the season or like by the end of the, the season, it could reach uh, 50,000 50, bees, bees or sixty thousand bees. Um, and then the size of the colony uh, decreases again during winter uh, to like 15 to 20,000 bees. And then that's it's a, it's like a cycle. Wow, thank you. So um, we're going to talk about honey, uh, its components and its benefits. <clears throat> and when we talk about uh, the benefits of honey, of course, we're talking about raw honey, not uh, not supermarket honey, because as you may know, um, most supermarket honey is honey is actually just uh, a diluted um, uh, syrup, uh, it's like sugar water syrup. So um, raw honey will have uh, it's 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 probably it's seventy to eighty percent carbohydrate car carbohydrates. Uh, it has mineral, mi minerals and uh, vi vitamins, it has enzymes, uh, proteins, and amino acids. Uh, the water, uh, the water um, could go uh, from 5% to 16 or 17%. Of course, the less uh, the water uh, in, in the honey, the, the better. And um, there are countless benefits uh, for honey from uh, um, soothing cough to um, providing nutrients, uh, treating wounds, uh, healing burns, uh, helping with seasonal allergy. Um, it reduces, um, it reduces, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's an antibacterial uh, and antifungal and it's, 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 and it's also helps with blood sugar regulation. So it, it, there are so many benefits uh, for honey and especially if you're, if you're, if you're uh, consuming uh, raw honey that is Unpasteurized and uh, unheated, uh, because when you're heating honey, you this, you're basically destroying most of its benefits. When you put a spoon of honey in your tea, you're um, it's 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 still better than sugar, but you, you've you've wasted the, most of the benefits and uh, most of the enzymes are destroyed by heat. So um, it's it's better to if you wanna add honey to your tea, it's better to wait until it's a little bit warm. So uh, processed honey is is it has all the antioxidants removed and the, the beneficial enzymes are destroyed by pasteurization. When um, raw honey, it it actually boosts immunity and it's anti-inflammatory. Uh, um, raw honey is basically extracted uh, straight from the hive to the jar without uh, processing processing it or or um, or heating it. So you just uh, um, you just basically, I'll show you how honey is extracted. Uh, so this is a frame of honey. When when the bees the bees bring nectar and they put they deposit the nectar in the cells and then they cure it uh, in the in the uh, to make it honey, and then they seal the frame with a layer of uh, of wax to keep it to save it. Wow. Sorry. Um, so, um, I'll, this video, hopefully it will work. Yes. Thank God. So we, we, we extract the honey by uncapping the layer, the first layer of wax. So you, you uncap it, you remove the first layer of wax on both sides. And then, um, we put this frame as it is in a machine that spins and the honey will drips, drips on both sides. They're honey cause they're real. I'm sorry, say again. 
Wow. Oh, this is so real. Wow. Ellie's doing this. Sorry, could everyone put themselves on mute if uh, if they're not speaking? I would have really loved to show you an actual beehive, but it's it's raining like uh, crazy outside. <laughs> um, this is the honey extractor that we use. It's a um, it's a it's quite a big extractor, so it doesn't take much time to extract the honey. But um, yeah, it, the spinning the frames could uh, take from like five ten minutes to sometimes twelve hours or even twenty four hours. Uh, filter is and filtering the honey usually also takes a lot of time because you 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 would want to filter your honey once but no more uh, but it's the more you filter your honey the more you're taking away from it uh, as in terms of benefits so we we tend to barely filter our honey just to make sure that everything that the hive and the bees can offer is is still in the honey from uh, pollen to traces of propolis uh, and royal jelly Um, we'll talk a little bit about bees in mythology because it's uh, it's quite uh, interesting how the Greeks, for example, uh, the, the Aristotle uh, was the Greek god of beekeeping, and the Greeks um, used to make uh, use they used to uh, make mead. I think that was pr probably the one of the, the first uh, alcoholic beverages, um, and it's made of honey. Uh, if you haven't tried mead before, um, it's really delicious and amazing. And um, they, they, you can't you can't re you can't find it everywhere. It's uh, I had to go to um, uh, Borough Market, uh, the the big market where I think there was one supplier who had like a, a variety of meads. And uh, so the Greeks used to call it the beverage of the gods. Um, in um, uh, in, for the, the Roman, Melona was the uh, Roman goddess of bees and um, gold plaques in the British Museum, they were imposed, uh, imposed with winged bee goddess dated to the 7th century. Uh, the bee found in India was believed to be the sacred insect and the bridge the natural and the bri that bridged the natural world uh, to the underworld. Um, Now, uh, there are different types of beehives and uh, there are different schools of beekeeping. So if you're learning um, beekeeping uh, from, um, so yeah, there are, usually it depends on who, who teaches you beekeeping, you usually end up uh, having a specific set of views on, on things. Um, but to give you an idea, for example, there are, uh, there are people who keep bees for commercial reasons, so they're more interested in 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 um, having uh, hives that could offer them um, easier management styles and and uh, better ways of um, extracting the honey. and And there are other beekeepers who who would like to keep bees in in a much in a much more natural way, in a sustainable way. So, so there are hives that cater to every every uh, need, basically, including the very the very commercial and um, conventional uh, way. Um, the standard beehives um, it provides protection from weather and predators. Uh, you can add and remove boxes as the colony changes in size. Um, you can give uh, and provide frames and wax foundation so the bees can use uh, to make the honeycomb so the uh, where they where the queen can lay eggs and uh, where they store the honey and the pollen um, you can add and remove frames uh, as the colony size changes and having a standard beehive with with frames allows you to inspect and check the health of the of the colony um, and of course, when it comes to harvesting the honey, uh, having um, the frames allow it. It's much, it makes it much much easier, and uh, a lot a lot less uh, 
uh, wasteful of resources um, to extract the honey and then give the frame back to the bees and they can just fill it in in a matter of days if there is nectar flow. Now the alternative is the natural beekeeping. So this this hive is called the top bar hive. Um, now because bees are endangered, uh, some beekeepers now feel that they need to protect bees uh, rather than ex exploit them. Uh, so a sustainable and natural beekeeping method aims, uh, it aims to minimize interference and it helps the bees uh, survive. Um, this is the top bar hive. Um, the, the bees are just given a bar uh, with a tiny bit of wax underneath to make it, uh, to give them, to tell them in which, in which direction you would like them to build, build the honeycomb and then the bees will draw down uh, a natural honeycomb without uh, without uh, the foundation. Um, the inspecting these hives is possible, but it's more um, tricky for a new beekeepers because you need to know how to handle the bees and the honeycomb without destroying it. It's usually very, very delicate and um, it's much easier, uh, of course, a framed, a framed hive, managing a framed hive and inspecting a framed hive is, is easier. But if you know how to manage a, a top bar hive, a natural hive, uh, is, 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 it's in the, in the, it, it benefits the bees uh, a lot more. So a top bar hive uh, mimics the bees' natural home in a hollowed uh, outreach. So it's, uh, it's like a, a tree, a, ca a tree cavity that the bees are using, um, and they can just expand uh, or reduce the size of the colony as as they need to do so. Um, this was um, our first hive. Uh, it was this was actually our second hive, and uh, it's a hive that uh, I built. Um, it has an observation window as well, so you can just look at the bees without disturbing them. And it's one of the happiest colonies that we have at the moment. Uh, it's in my garden right outside, and we've had I've had a colony uh, live there uh, for this is this is its second year, and it's expanding. Uh, it's 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 growing. It's a very healthy colony. Um, a ware hive is is a very similar to the top bar hive, but it's uh, vertical it's vertical uh, okay, i always get confused between vertical and horizontal <laughs> it's vertical uh, so a wari hive is uh, another natural form of beekeeping it uses top bars uh, same like w w with a, with a top with a top bar hive it allows the bees to draw uh, comb naturally and it allows uh, the observation through the window without disturbing the bees Um, the national hive is the traditional and the most popular hive um, in, in the UK at the moment. Uh, it uses top bar frames, uh, frames like this, uh, usually often given with a, with a layer of foundation, 3D printed foundation uh, that uh, the, uh, are, gi are given to the bees so they can build on top of it. Um, this national hive is is very very popular and it's it's the most used one. Um, there are they if you're buying one from the, in the market, uh, they, mostly they they come either in pine or from pine made from pine or made from cedar. Uh, the ones that are made from pine don't offer much uh, protection against the for the weather against the weather. Um, the ones that are made of cedar, they're, they're definitely a lot better and they offer the bees much more protection. If you're planning or if you want to keep bees, these are the most important equipment uh, tools you might need. So you need a bee brush. Uh, if, you're, if you're moving boxes around, uh, sometimes you need to brush the bees to make sure you don't hurt any. Um, bees are very docile, but the second you hurt one of theirs, they uh, release a pheromone. Uh, the, the bees, the bee that get hurt, release a, releases a pheromone that alarms the whole colony. So having, like, making sure you don't hurt any bee is crucial for for your safety usually. Um, the hive tool is very important because we're everything is sticky inside the hive and moving. 
frames around is very difficult. It's, it's impossible without having the Hive tool. So anytime you go to your bee yard and you've forgotten your Hive tool, it's a wasteful day. You'll spend it just trying to move one frame or two. It's usually an impossible job with all that honey and uh, the propolis uh, that the bees use to seal off their colony. Um, you'll need uh, a suit and gloves. Now, bees um, treat us like bears. So whenever we approach the hive without using the smoker, the bees would try to sting the face, the, the eyes, mainly the eyes and the hands because they think they think that we are fairy animals like bears and so they always um, they would always f give you a warning by flying into your head and pumping into your head if you didn't move back then they would try to sting uh, your face or your hands now the smoker is our first line of defense um, it's because guard bees communicate with the rest of the colony by releasing an alarm pheromone uh, the smoke masks that smell that so the message doesn't travel and the colony is not on alert basically it's like cutting the internet no communication between the guard bees and the rest of the colony so the smoker is very important uh, it's very important also because um, uh, when you use the smoker, you're tricking the bees into thinking that there might be fire coming and um, they prepare for evacuation. So they need to take as much honey, fill their honey stomach with as much honey as possible. So they can, if there is fire, they can just move and start a new home somewhere else. Um, now, um, the smoke, uh, yeah, it, it tricks them into thinking that there might be fire. So they eat so much honey that they are honey drunk. They they are happy. They they forget about you basically. And um, uh, when they eat uh, this much honey, they're they're unable to bend uh, to and sting. So they're so fat that they cannot even sting anymore. That's why using the smoker is very important. As long as you're using organic matter, you're burning organic matter inside. So. You're not, burned, you're not burning cardboard or um, so you're using some, something natural. Um, and in fact, if you if you burn dried uh, thyme or lavender or oregano, uh, all these herbs will, will, will also benefit the bees and support the bees against uh, the varroa mite, which is one of the most, uh, one of the worst nightmares of a beekeeper and the bees. Uh, one of the reasons why bees are collapsing in the world is because of the varroa mite. It's a mite that's uh, killing the bees. And smoking the bees with, with the dry thyme and oregano is actually helps the bees get rid of the varroa. Now, throughout the season, as a beekeeper, you will have uh, different tasks. Uh, sometimes it is necessary, necessary, for example, to reduce the hive into a smaller hive, uh, which we call a nucleus uh, over winter. So it's uh, during winter, if you give them less space to, to look after, it would be um, much better for them because if, if, they're, if, they're, if it's a small colony in a big hive, they will use all their resources trying to heat and maintain the temperature in the space. Uh, if they have a smaller space during winter, then it's much easier for them to maintain the temperature inside the colony. So uh, when opening the beehive, the most important things you need to be looking at is first, first the queen. So you, we wanna make sure that the queen is there and it's laying eggs. Um, if you don't see the queen herself, because the queen, the queen is always shy and hiding, um, you can look for signs of the presence of the queen by looking for eggs. Um, you can, you should look for queen cells to see if the bees are preparing to create a new queen, which means if you see queen cells, it means that the bees are preparing to either uh, replace their queen or to swarm and create a second colony. So splitting the hive in two basically and uh, creating a, a new colony. Um, you need to check on the bees' health and to make sure that there is enough space for the queen to lay eggs. You need to make sure that there is enough for uh, enough space for the foragers uh, to store pollen and nectar. Um, 
seasonal jobs that you need to do is management, uh, swarm management. So especially if you live in a residential area, it's important to uh, to be uh, on top of your hives and make sure that your hives are not uh, swarming every day and uh, going to the neighbors. So um, yes, yeah, swarm management is one of the most important tasks you do in spring, uh, honey extraction, uh, late spring, uh, varroa treatment, uh, especially before winter, um, and preparing for winter is usually assessing the colony size and the stores and how much honey they have inside. These are very important uh, books. Uh, if someone is interested in reading more and learning more about beekeeping, um, honeybee ecology and the wisdom of the hive, honeybee democracy, uh, these are amazing books that will teach you a lot. Uh, uh, the Buzz About Bees is also a great book, uh, and The Biology of the Honeybee uh, is, is, is a great source for uh, new beekeepers. Um, I hope uh, the presentation wasn't too long. Uh, and I hope that you uh, learned some interesting facts today. I'll now stop sharing my screen and uh, yeah. And then if you have any questions, please please unmute yourself. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about uh, bees, about bees and refugees. Um, yeah, any questions you have, please hit me. <laughs> I've been talking for I've been talking for an hour or so. <laughs> I have a question, uh, Ali. Um, not about beekeeping, but about honey. Uh, you yeah. said earlier that um, essentially um, processed honey, uh, the supermarket honey, are essentially uh, water syrups or syrups or sugar syrups. Um, how do you distinguish um, that? I imagine that a, a runny honey like uh, um, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, like uh, sometimes you, you get um, honeys with honeycomb uh, and yeah. then uh, you've got um, manuka, you've yeah. got some uh, liquidy honey. So I imagine that liquidy honey is kind of almost like a sugar syrup. Um, I mean, to be honest, uh, when you extract fresh spring honey, it's very liquidy, it's very, it's very soft. Uh, so it, it really, it's not an indication, but if it's cold, if the weather is cold and the honey, the honey is still running, that is definitely a sign that the honey was heated and it was pasteurized, which means it was mixed with other honeys and it was heated to make, to make it in that shape. So raw honey will always crystallize in, 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 in cold temperatures, in, in low temperatures. And it's only natural for the honey to crystallize and become set honey in cold weather. Um, it's actually a good, it's a good sign. If the honey crystallizes, it's, it's a great sign. It means that it wasn't heated. So it, had, it hasn't lost most of, its, most of its properties. Oh, I was thinking the opposite because I thought, you know, crystallizing honey actually is not you know, good because I have to kind of really spoot it out. <laughs> yeah, really it's, 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 it's a very uh, common mis misconception even even when i when i was a child i always thought that it was mixed with sugar that it because it had <laughs> that uh, crunchiness uh, to it and or like this is filled with sugar it's actually the opposite uh, <laughs> um and if you're if you're if you're buying if you're buying honey i think the best way is to look at the label uh steer away stay away from anything that says blend of eu and non-eu honey Anything that says blend of honey, just steer away from it because a blend of honey means that they had to to heat the honey in order to mix it, which means they could add um, rice syrup, which is undetected by even even by labs, uh, and it's it's practiced especially especially like there is so much honey coming from from China that is diluted with sugar syrup and the labs cannot detect it, um, and then they're Whenever there there is a way to block that honey, the honey is then transferred to other countries and sold as if it was produced in other countries. And uh, it's 
that that diluted honey invaded the market i think there was a recent uh, report done by the independent uh, that they they were testing honeys in the uk in from supermarkets and they found out that 90 percent of the honey supermarkets was just diluted it's a it's a solution of sugar water um so it's either the beekeepers they're mixing they're heating the honey and mixing it with with rice syrup or the beekeepers are feeding so much sugar water to the bees that the bees the most of the honey made in the hive is made from sugar water that has no value not for the bees that ha doesn't have value for for us neither for the bees and that's one of the reasons why bees are dying because um you get the British Beekeeping Association telling beekeep new beekeepers that it's okay to take half of the honey if you compensate by feeding sugar water. Now, imagine if you're feeding your kids Coca-Cola for three months for lunch, breakfast, and dinner, and what do you expect? Their health will be um, will be deteriorating. It will get worse with time. The more honey you're taking away and compensate, you're compensating with sugar water. The more you're killing them basically with time um, and the honey you're selling to your customers is diluted is made from sugar water so it has no 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 real value i hope that answered your question uh, yes uh, thank you lastly daryl has a has a question as well but do you sell um uh, honey uh, from bees and refugees um we in hammersmith we store our honey in bushwhacker whole foods uh, it's a small oh, yeah. store all right okay I'm in King Street or King's Road? I'm not sure. Oh, King, Street. Uh, King Street. King Street. Opposite our office. King's, yeah. Yeah. In, in King Street. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. There are ama amazing, amazing bunch of people working there, and it's one of my favorite shops in in London, really. Excellent. Daryl has a question. Good, good morning. Sorry, I was late. I had trouble trying to join. Um, I would like to uh, Ali first and foremost. That was an amazing presentation. Thank I feel you. I've learned more from your presentation than I've read in books. I find bees very interesting, but it goes in one ear and out the other. And I feel today I've stored it, a bit like the bees and the honey. So thank you and very well done. <laughs> thank um, you. May I ask, pleasure. May I ask, what is the difference between your honey and manuka honey? So um, the mind. manuka, the manuka honey has amazing medicinal properties because it is made from the manuka flower that only grows. It only grows in, in New Zealand and Australia. And that is why um, the manuka honey is so expensive because that flower grows only there. And that flower has medicinal properties. So uh, whatever properties the plant has, you'll see that reflected in your honey. Uh, whether it's uh, if you have thyme, if you have cedar around you, the, if you have horse chestnut around you, you'll see that reflected in the honey. Um, the honey we sell uh, in London is honey made from uh, London gardens. And what's so not, what's so great about London honey that uh, each garden has a complete different set of flowers. Um, and there is a, a huge diversity of uh, sources of nectar and pollen in London, which you, you can really see that in the honey. When you taste the honey, you can notice the notes of different flowers, the smells and the flavors from different flowers which is amazing. Um, so the Manuka honey has the, a lot of um, medicinal benefits, but um, I'm pretty sure it's also a little bit overpriced and commercialized. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and unfor unfortunately, it's, uh, there is no way for us to know if, the, if what they say is Manuka honey, what's labeled as Manuka honey is really Manuka honey. Um, so um, yeah. I hope this answers your questions. <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. I think uh, Barbara had a question, or that's. Uh, I did. I see yes. I, uh, yeah. Um, the, the signal's not brilliant enough where I am to go video and uh, and speaking and listen to you. Um, that was it was, it was really interesting. I was a bit late as well. I couldn't couldn't get in, and then I, sent, I spent some time in the waiting room. So I wondered, is the um, would what this the Zoom thing be available as a video so we could um, catch up on the bit that I missed, and also yep. show it to somebody else who couldn't um, who couldn't join? Um, that would be really helpful. And yeah, so, so I'll share the link with you, but it's on our Hammersmith and Fulham YouTube page. Um, oh right. So we yeah we've been streaming the whole session, um, but yeah I'll, I'll I'll share the link so you can watch it back. That'd be that'd be helpful, and so I want to show it to somebody else as well. 
um, which will help with my other point about the um, the books that he um, suggested. There were three books or something um, that sort of came up on the page during his pres um, Ali's presentation. I'll, um, I'll write down the names in the chat if, for you if you want. Oh, that'd be great. Lovely. Yes, thank you. Or thank I'm, you. I'm also very happy to, um, to, to, for, to email you the, just the whole presentation. Uh, uh, if you like, uh, I'm more than happy to do that. If you if you drop your email in the chat, I can okay, email yeah. the presentation so you have all the information. Oh, that's really, really helpful. I will do. I have put it in there right now, actually, um, while I'm doing this. Um, um, I just have one other question. Oh, do you ever do any um, sort of uh, like intro courses type of thing to, to um, help sliders? Yeah. Yeah, we, we usually uh, we usually plan uh, organize workshops and courses with Phoenix Farm and Hammersmith Community Gardens. Mm, so, right. yeah, um, I think uh, we're going to uh, we're going for we're, we're going to have some um, like hands-on beekeeping workshops uh, in Phoenix Farm in uh, using the hives that uh, uh, that are placed in Phoenix Farm in Shepherd's Bush. So, if you live locally. Um, I think just um, drop an email to uh, to uh, Hammersmith Community Gardens, and they will let you know. They'll share with you all the dates and uh, the detail and the information. Lovely, that'd be helpful. Yeah, a bit, a bit a bit away, but if you know know in advance, you can plan that way. So, thank you. You're welcome. Well, we we also as like bees and refugees, we also um, we 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 have like um, an experience. Uh, that we 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 list on Airbnb experiences, so it's like a, a session that you can come for, like a, pr a proper presentation on honeybees, and then you dress up, where you you put on the beekeeping suit, and you go through a hive inspection. So, so you have a hands-on experience. Oh, that be. I just think as, as a present to somebody actually would be a really nice thing to do. So, is that on your? Um, would you get that via your Twitter page or something? I only found um, about, came across you yesterday by sheer accident. So, <laughs> it's um, if you look bees and ref is you if you type in bees and refugees Airbnb, I think it will take you straight to to the experience. Great, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, that has got the question. <laughs> um, thanks. I'm sorry I was late as well. Um, oh. I'm just hear a bit more. I may have missed it about um, your work with refugees. Really, um, work for charity that um, works with refugees. Um, and at the moment, we do online. Yeah. Um, we do uh, nature each week. I'm very interested in the young people. My hand is not coming up. Sure. Don't stick it in. Can you hear me? All right. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Well, I uh, couldn't hear sorry. the last bit. Yeah, I just work with a charity uh, with refugees. We deliver weekly online sessions and we cover nature and all sorts of things, including bees. Uh, so I was interested in your work with refugees and how either I could get the group I work with involved or anything online that's available. Um, yes. And I'm interested in that side of your work. Apologies if, if you've already gone over that. So. Um, no, I, I think, uh, Sophie, what do you think? I think if we have time I can go back to the first bit of my presentation and like I'm happy to do so um, what do you think um, yeah we've, we, we've got we've got time so we yeah, have, feel we have time so I, I can I'll, I'll happily go back to the presentation and just uh, share with you some more information about uh, about uh, the work that we do with refugees um, would you mind making me host again can you share I don't know if you can can you share your screen or do you have to be a host I have to be a host. Okay, no, that's fine. I will. Um... Well, while Ali is uh, doing that, uh, I just want to read out the message from Anthony Antonucci. Thank you very much, Ali. This was a wonderful presentation, and it sounds like a great program. A lot like Beast for Development. It was worth getting up at 5 a.m. to watch from New York State, United U.S. That's that's so kind of you. Thank you so much, Ali. Great, I've just made you a host, Ali, so you should be able to share now. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, can you all uh, see my screen? Sophie, can you see my can you see my yes. presentation? Okay, yeah. great. So, so um, to give you to give you an idea about bees and refugees, so it was a it's a community initiative that we started in 2019. I founded uh, the initiative in February 2020, actually, um, and it was crowdfunded fully by the community and uh, supported also by Hammersmith and Fulham Council. Um, we, the way we work with refugees is that we have a partnership with uh, organizations like the Refugee Resettlement Program with the Red Cross, uh, or organizations like uh, Mosaic Charity that uh, works with and supports refugees in, in the UK and in Greece. Um, so we've been using beekeeping as, 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 ther as therapy. And if you haven't had the uh, uh, like an experience with the bees before, uh, I highly recommend you to to do so because wearing the beekeeping suit and being standing around thousands of flying and buzzing bees, it's it that the experience itself um, is so calming um, and it's it's so therapeutic that 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 actually led me to to quitting my job in the fashion industry and starting this whole initiative. Um, so. So far, uh, so far we've we've worked with almost uh, 200, 200 refugees, um, mainly um, in in um, uh, from the resettlement programs in in Hammersmith and uh, and Camden Town and and Waterloo. Uh, so we've been inviting them inviting them to join workshops in Oasis Farm, which is a tiny hidden gem in Waterloo. Um, so we we offered them workshops in Oasis Farm and in in Hammersmith Hammersmith Community Gardens. Um, these those are our partners. So we've partnered with the British Red Cross, um, with Oru Space, uh, Dulwich Prep School, Hammersmith Academy, uh, Hammersmith Community Gardens, and Oasis Farm. Um, and Jamie's farm. Jamie's farm is is a, is a beautiful farm um, in Lewis, outside London, and uh, the farm is used um, to offer workshops uh, uh, built around nature and mental health uh, for to uh, to um, uh, students that are on the edge of being expelled from school from being from having um, um, behavior issues. However, I think with all the kids that I've I've worked with on the farm. Um, I think once they're on the farm and around nature, they're all they're all amazing. I don't know. Uh, it feels like nature has that element of that calming element on 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 children and anyone who who's struggling with their mental health. And um, I'm speaking from experience because uh, I, I was struggling with. Uh, I'm I, I still have PTSD and working with the bees and being in nature is one of the best solution that I I found. Um, that worked that worked for me um this is mainly our team uh, these are these were the first volunteers to join our team but bees and refugees right now is is a community led um initiative so we have more or less 20 volunteers um always uh, looking after whether it's social media managing social media or re reaching out to organizations and and uh, supporting with the workshops and with building the bee, the beehives and preparing the bee, uh, the beehives and working with the bees. Now I'm not gonna go much into details, uh, but yeah, we're we're hoping to um, to raise uh, two hundred thousand pounds to establish our community our community farm and our apiary farm um, ar somewhere around London. So if you know anyone who might have a piece of land that they might interested in leasing it. <laughs> Or um, if, if there is a cheap piece of land that they might be interested in selling it, that would be great. Uh, it's it's something we're always looking at, we're looking for, uh, and we're looking forward to. Um, if you have um, any, any um, if you have any questions, I'm I'm more than happy to answer your questions, Bernadette. Uh, um, I'll I'll drop my email here, and you can uh, send me an email um, if you if you like to uh, to take this further. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
Um, any if does if anyone has any questions about the bees or beekeeping is zen like or so, sorry I'm just reading the comments. Do we have any final questions for Ali? Sophie, just to ensure that we capture all the requests, like the email addresses. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm capturing that now. Thank you. If there are no other questions, um, I, I just had a quick question on kind of how bees and refugees have found kind of the last year being in, in the pandemic and how that's impacted on kind of your, whether it has impacted, because you know you're outside, but um, how it has. I mean, it, it definitely uh, had a, a very positive impact and a very neg negative impact at the same time, because um, setting up... Um, bees and refugees in the middle of the pandemic and making it sustainable is such a challenge um, especially during during like yeah during lockdowns and we were most of the most of the year we were unable to join farmers market or offer hands-on beekeeping experiences so we didn't really like we had the first uh, injection of cash for, from crowdfunding but then we lost we didn't have any income for for almost a year and a half while we were working and uh, like volunteering just myself and our volunteers we were just we've been working for almost uh, since the very since almost well it's been a year and a half now that we've been working all of us for free so it's it, it in that aspect in that sense it was very challenging because we were we're not generating money yet and it's always because of the it's the difficult time because of lockdown and like the, the all these all this strange situation with, that we've been through. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, it had a very positive impact because people were desperate for any ad outdoor activity or any activity any interesting activity that helped them break isolation and feel that they're learning something new or like they're seeing or yeah they're coming across something new uh, that is that that was positive um, uh, during during this year um, so we've, we've had um, a lot of people offer offer us uh, a lot of uh, support whether with with their time or with their work so and they did so because they were also just sitting at home and they just wanted to do anything uh, to feel good about themselves <laughs> so we had so many amazing people join our our work just because of the situation and uh, we've met um, and we've organized uh, for example zoom uh, zoom uh, beekeeping courses on zoom during the lockdown that helped many break isolation and feel that they are they are part of a smaller community or like they're part of a bigger community. Um, so yeah, it, it had both it, it had both positive and negative uh, impact on us. That's yeah, that's really good to hear, and um, I'm sure kind of as as we're easing restrictions and opening up again, you'll have so many people who are interested in uh, in getting involved um are there any any final questions um before we close i've just seen that there's um there's a question in the chat about the recording and it will be i'll post the link again to our youtube recording so you will be able to watch it um afterwards i think we've just had one more question um so um this person's interested to know how many people you've worked with um, who were initially fearful of bees and how they gradually overcame this. Um, so I think most children I worked with were so brave that I was shocked. Like <laughs> I was, I was so surprised to see children being so interested and like asking so many questions and like 
approaching the bees without even wanting to put on the bee suit. I'm like, no, 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 like you have to fear the bees a little bit. Like they're very docile if you don't hurt them, but accidents could happen. So, um, however, yes, I also, I, I worked with perhaps, so the total number of people we worked with is so far uh, more or less 200 people. Um, I remember specifically three cases that uh, were, that they were so scared of the bees at first that they didn't even wanna have the experience and then by the time we and of course they had to do, to do the experience they, they we convinced them to put on the protective suit and and uh, join join the group and the three of them um, were were so into bees at the end that they were asking to to join the second group like they were like yeah can we stay please for and go with the second group it, it was really fascinating, especially because um, one of them had, uh, um, I was sorry, I forget, I forgot the word. Uh, so um, the, 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 the kid was, uh, was very ill and he, he was never interested in learning anything new and he had, he had anxiety of being around people and uh, around any new experiences. Um, and it was so fascinating because by the end of the day, the, the, his mother came to talk to me and told me that she never saw her kid interact with with others the say the, the way she saw him interact with with others, and she never saw her saw him um, interested in learning something like he was interested in learning uh, about the bees. And that kid uh, joined the workshops. Uh, so we had workshops uh, for four weeks uh, in, in Oasis Farm. And each group had uh, one day, just like they were, we offered them one workshop uh, and then we had to go for other groups. But that kid joined the four workshops. He was coming to every workshop and uh, the mother was just fascinated. And I was, I was of course, the, that uh, that was so rewarding to me to see it was like that it was yeah just thinking about it my ears are like uh, my eyes are like uh, tearing up <laughs> that is amazing to hear what an amazing story and um yeah so interesting to hear kind of the ways that beekeeping can can really um can it is a therapy and it can help people um so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Do we have any final questions um, for Ali before we close? Well, I just wanted to say um, a massive thank you to Ali for, for coming today um, and for um, telling us about bees and refugees and um, the amazing work that you're doing kind of locally. Um, and also for, for telling us a bit more about beekeeping. I know that I've learned so much um, that I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna read up on. And um, I hope everyone else has, has found it really, really in interesting as well. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for coming today and thank you to everyone else for, for attending as well. Thank you. Thank you all for being and listening, for being here and listening to me. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It was really thank good. you. Thank Brilliant you. Presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely day. Have a lovely day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.